Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. Space is a terrifying thing because it is void of everything that life needs to survive. And so when venturing into space, having a ship that is able to survive a great deal of punishment is at the top of my list of important features. Today we'll be taking a look at seven of the most durable and toughest starships in science fiction. Had all those brave folks who rushed Area 51 made it past the guard towers, well, they probably would have eventually reached a bunker holding a very advanced Harvester Starfighter. The Harvesters were a race of degenerate locusts like Xenos who raced across the galaxy destroying planets and extracting resources to refuel and expand their armada. All of their ships, from the massive mothership to the city destroyers, were completely shielded from all types of traditional weapons, ranging from missiles to even nuclear warheads. The alien technology was so advanced that even their tiny fighters had shields on them as well. When humanity first encountered the alien fighters over Los Angeles, a wing of F-18 Hornets were unable to do much damage to the alien crafts. Even though their air-to-air -air missiles were able to track these alien starfighters, when they made contact with the alien shields, it would just knock them off course a little bit and do no damage. Later on during one skirmish, we even see an alien fighter collide with a human jet fighter. The alien fighter tumbles out of control from the collision, but continues flying on afterwards. Until Jeff Goldblum basically manages to figure out how to take those shields down, these starfighters were indestructible. Unless, of course, you could force them to crash. But even then, the ship more or less stayed intact. It was only the pilots who died. The UNSC Infinity-class supercarrier was probably one of the most advanced starships humanity has ever created. But it was tainted by the corrupt technologies of the Xeno Forerunners and Covenant. It wasn't a pure human creation. Of course, we must not turn away the degenerate Xeno's technology when it can continue man's crusade to bridge the Halo universe with the Warhammer 40k universe. But when it comes to tough, human-made designs pre-Covenant War, look no further than the OG Pillar of Autumn. Maybe I'm just old school. Maybe the first Halo for me was the best game in the series and all of the other ones I followed it were just incremental improvements that will never help me relive the nostalgia of playing Halo for the first time. Maybe. Now the UNSC Pillar of Autumn was made before we even made first contact with the Covenant and it was a beast of a ship. Classified as a Halcyon light cruiser, this 1,171 meter long ship was not even considered that large by human standards back then. As a matter of fact, it was considered the lightest cruiser-class ship ever created. The Pillar of Autumn was constructed on Reyes McLee's shipyard on Mars on December 1st, 2510. Dr. Robert McLee's designed the internal structure of the Pillar of Autumn and added an extensive amount of cross bracings, which created a honeycomb-like internal structure. The cost and additional mass that this structure created on the ship at the time was seen as over the top and completely unnecessary. And so all future Halcyon class like cruisers did not have this internal structure built in. Now the Pillar of Autumn was almost 43 years old when the Covenant attacked and destroyed Reach. The light cruiser had received some additional upgrades by this time to its weapons and engines, and it also received a layer of titanium A ablative armor plating, which is very useful against the Covenant's energy-based weapons. Despite being such an old and relatively small ship, the Pillar Bottom would perform bravely during the fall of Reach, and was one of the most active and deadly ships the UNSC fielded in the battle. It was also one of the few ships that managed to survive the fall of Reach and multiple enemy strikes. And this was really thanks to this unorthodox internal structure that was planned almost 40 years earlier. Unfortunately, the Pillar of Autumn left Reach only to find themselves being swarmed by enemy ships once they jumped to the first Halo structure discovered by humanity. Somehow, the damaged cruiser managed to take out four additional Covenant ships before crashing into the surface of the Halo construct. Despite this massive collision, it still remained relatively intact. The Borg Cube has always been one of the most menacing vessels that Starfleet has to take on. During the Battle of Wolf 359, 39 out of 40 Starfleet ships were destroyed within minutes of engaging a Borg Cube. An additional 11,000 Starfleet personnel were either lost or assimilated. Earth's entire defenses were rendered useless by just one of these massive ships. Dozens of more Starfleet ships were lost during the incursion of 2373, also known as the Battle of Sector 001. The reason why the Borg Cube was so powerful stemmed not only from its size, which was over three kilometers squared, but also how difficult it was to actually destroy one of these ships. 
Borg cubes were actually designed to be able to destroy and assimilate entire civilizations and planets, so these things were very, very large and well-equipped. The cube itself was made out of tritanium, which was an extremely tough metal, and the internal structure was full of tens of thousands of drones and other automatic systems. Unlike more traditional ships, the Borg also decentralized the internal structure of their ship, so engineering quarters, bridges, and other essential uh, compartments are scattered all over the place and very hard to destroy with just one single shot. On top of that, these ship's automatons could quickly repair the ship even when in warp or in the middle of a battle. Our next ship, the Icarus II, is not extremely durable in the traditional sense. It doesn't even really have weapons on board. Nonetheless, it's one of the most powerful and important ships ever to be designed by humanity. You see, in the film Sunshine, the sun has essentially begun to die, and Earth is slowly freezing to death. In order to save humanity, we have sent two massive shield ships towards the sun with the hopes of using massive ordinances to restart our star's fusion reaction. The Icarus II is a spindly and long ship with many different compartments that sustain a crew for the long trip to the sun. But what protects it all for the last stage of the mission is a gigantic shield that is covered in gold plates. This should allow the team to, in theory, get close enough to the sun to actually launch their ordinance without being burnt up. The Fall of Gadia has been immortalized by countless Imperial records and YouTube commenters on this channel. The famous line, the planet cracked before the guard did, is one of the most famous lines in all of Warhammer 40k. It is the rallying call of all Imperial Guardsmen when facing the various threats and horrors of the galaxy and the war. But what exactly broke Cadia? Well, it was this thing, a Blackstone Fortress. These were massive space station-like constructs that were originally built during the ancient wars between the Old Ones and the Necrons. The Blackstone Fortresses were made out of a onyx-like material that humanity has no idea how it was made or how it was forged, but it is almost indestructible. While humanity could never understand how these constructs worked or what was housed inside of them, they nonetheless began taking over these Blackstone Fortresses and began building their own weapons and placements and fortifications on them. During the early the Imperium, humanity would basically tow these gigantic star bases into a sector and then use it as a staging point for any type of invasion or offensive. But during the 13th Black Crusade, Chaos would assault Cadia, and the forces of Chaos would send a captured Blackstone Fortress into Cadia's planetary gravity well. The massive ship hit the planet so hard that it cracked it in half. When humanity finally made contact with the rest of the species in the Milky Way in Mass Effect, they quickly found out about an apocalyptic cycle that governed our galaxy. A group of sentient machines known as the Reapers would descend on the galaxy every 50,000 years and destroy all signs of advanced civilization. The Reapers themselves were gigantic capital ship-like constructs who were built in the shape of large squids. These ships were far more advanced than any other ship in the known galaxy, and they were also much larger as well. Amongst the oldest and largest Reapers was a ship named the Harbinger. It was already extremely difficult to take down even the smallest Reaper ship. The Harbinger, however, was so large that it could defeat an entire human fleet by itself. In case you guys are wondering why I left Star Wars vessels out in this video, well, that's because on our other channel, Generation Tech, we did an entire video breaking down the toughest and most durable ships in Star Wars. So do check that out, and also don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content on this channel. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. My name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie, and you are the protagonist.